to discourage believers. This is the last message on this topic. While you're turning to Hebrews 6, I think it's amazing that two examples in particular, one in the Old and one in the New Testament of apostates, the servant of Elisha, Gehazi, in the Old Testament, and Demas, the servant of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. They both started out really well. They were as close to the top senior leadership of God in the world at the time, and they were serving God diligently. But both fell light years. Both descended greatly to a place where they left the faith and went back to the world. I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 6. I'll read verses 1 through 8 in the New King James Version. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. As I said, this is the sixth and last message on a passage of scripture that is really one of the most complicated, misunderstood, and sensitive in the Bible. But this scripture was designed not only to warn Jewish believers of the first century who were wavering in their faith, really struggling with sin and temptation, and considering denying Christ and returning to their old lives as slaves of sin, as servants of unrighteousness, but also to warn believers of every age to persevere in the faith to their last breath. But for my purposes, I'm warning you. On April 7, 2019, for our present practical purposes, those of us who are here today worshiping the Lord through the preaching of his word, because it's important to warn people with the warnings God gives. They're in the Bible for a reason, a very important reason. There are hundreds, literally, of warnings in Scripture directly from the heart of God for God's professing people to avoid certain dangers in an, in an effort to help them arrive safely in heaven's home. Because it's not how you start that matters, but how you finish the Christian life that is very, very important. Brethren, you and I need to finish this race. The New Testament has sharp warnings intended to reverse bad habits and have us going in the right direction, a direction that reestablishes spiritual discipline when it weakens and helps us develop godly habits that God will use by his grace to help us persevere in the faith and complete our earthly journey faithfully, faithfully, faithfully. Some of these warnings are real attention getters designed to wake us up from our lethargy and complacency like 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run but one receives the prize, run in such a way that you may obtain it. 
Like Galatians 5, 7 through 10, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Like Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, which we will get to eventually, God willing. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And lastly, like Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36, one that I like to repeat often. A warning text that specifically addresses believers of the last days. But take heed to yourselves, <clears throat> lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly, that is the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I felt I needed to open with those warnings to remind us of the importance of perseverance, which is the main theme we are touching on in our study of the book of Hebrews right now. It's one of the two main themes of the book of Hebrews, that you and I as professing Christians need to run the race in such a way that we finish the race and go to heaven. And frequently we depart from that place of urgency, that place of desperation, that place of taking the kingdom of heaven by force, for the violent take it by force. And we settle into a lifestyle of spiritual complacency. Pastors are called, among other things, in their teaching ministry to warn, not only to teach and exhort and rebuke and to lay down sound doctrine, but to warn. Well, let me review a few points about apostasy. We've been focusing on apostasy for the last six weeks. Let me conclude with some final things by way of review about apostasy we, before we move on to the text, which is the end of verse 6 through verse 8, which is where we are at now at the end of verse 6 of Hebrews 6. But let's touch on apostasy one last time to do justice to this very important subject which God has a lot to say about in the Bible. And you know, whenever God has a lot to say about something, there's a reason for that. God's mind and his thoughts and his heart is dwelling upon a subject that's very important to him and should be very important to his people. When he constantly through scripture repeats through by way of exposition and teaching of doctrine and application a, a, the same theme over and over and over again. Apostasy is the denying of Christ and the renouncing of the Christian faith that a person once held to. It is going back to the former pagan lifestyle of our pre-Christian life. In our study of Hebrews, we're considering the third warning passage in chapter 5, verse 11 through chapter 6 and verse 12, which describes a dullness toward the word of God and therefore warns believers not to be indifferent and sluggish when it comes to maturing in the faith that's both a doctrinal maturity as well as a spiritual growth, a spiritual maturity. Two elements about your faith and mine that we need to constantly be sanctified in. That is, growing in our understanding of doctrine, being fully and more broadly established in the doctrines of the Bible and the doctrines of the Christian faith. But secondly, there must be life to our study of doctrine, if we are to grow spiritually. Jesus said, the words that I give to you, they are spirit and they are life. So our study of the word of God must have a transformer 
connected with it to enable us to grow spiritually in the doctrine we learn and grow in. So to recap, an apostate is someone who hears the gospel, makes a profession of faith as a Christian, becomes identified with a Christian church most of the time, and then abandons his profession of faith, deliberately repudiates Christ, deserts the church, and takes his place among the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my prayer is that none of you here in this room or listening by way of the internet are within that category. And I pray that none of you will ever get to the place where you become an apostate. And that's why we're teaching and emphasizing this topic for the last several weeks. Because the apostasy is a sin committed only by unbelievers. Not by those who are deceived, but by those who are knowingly, willfully, and maliciously turn against the Lord. So it's clear, it's important that we be clear on that point. But just because you may indeed be saved still does not give you leeway to relax in this area of your growth, the need of maturity. Let's clarify a few things. Apostasy shouldn't be confused with the sin of the average unbeliever who hears the gospel but does nothing about it. Apostasy shouldn't be confused with the sin of the average unbeliever who hears the gospel but doesn't do anything about it. For example, a person may not respond to Christ after repeated invitations through the years, after being convicted by the Holy Spirit, but he's not an apostate. He can still be saved by putting his trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. Of course, if he dies in unbelief, he's lost forever. But he's not without hope if he's capable still in this life of exercising saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, apostasy should not be confused with backsliding. I could ask you a question, how many of you have backslidden before, but I know every hand would go up, except the ones who are not saved, because you have to be saved first for you to be able to backslide from that place of salvation. You're still saved, though. You're still saved. A true Christian may wander very far away from Christ. I think of the examples of King David, King Solomon, his son, even Samson. These wandered very, very far away. But because of unconfessed sin and uncrucified sin, the believer's fellowship with Christ is greatly weakened. And he may even reach a point where he's unrecognizable as a Christian, but still saved. True Christians, though, should stand out, right? They, the world should see a difference in us. But this backslidden Christian can still be restored to full fellowship with Christ as soon as he repents and forsakes his sin and trusts in the sanctifying blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse his conscience from dead works. As we read in Proverbs 28, 13, he who covers his sins will not prosper but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. And we've all been the objects of such mercy, have we not? Because of the prayers of our Lord Jesus, because of the preserving love of our Lord Jesus, because of the undying love for Jesus. Oh, he died for his people, but his love is undying for us to preserve us from apostasy. But apostasy, on the other hand, is not the same as the unpardonable sin mentioned in the Gospels. That was the sin of attributing the miracles of the Lord Jesus to the power of Satan. Christ's miracles were actually performed in the power of the Holy Spirit. But to attribute them to the devil was tantamount to blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Are you following me? Are you with me? It implied that the Holy Spirit was the devil 
And Jesus said that such a sin could never be forgiven, not in this life, nor in the life to come. Now, apostasy is similar to blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in that both these sins are committed by unbelievers. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and apostasy are sins committed by unbelievers. And that once these sins are committed, the person can never be saved. It's impossible for those who are once enlightened as we have studied in Hebrews 6 and renewed to renew them again to repentance. But there are differences between these two sins, but you never, ever, ever, brethren, want to commit them. Because once you do, there's no hope. What a warning for the church. Just like the Israelites who saw the great miracles in Egypt, who witnessed the mighty power of God crossing the Red Sea, who observed four miracles a day during 40 years of wilderness wandering, the cloudy pillar, the pillar of fire, the manna, and their clothes not wearing out. Believers in the early church who were still alive after our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, many of them witnessed the miracles of our Lord Jesus. But in the first few decades after our Lord's ascension, some of these Jewish believers apostatized, even though they saw the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ, just like the Jews in the Old Testament who saw so many of those miracles. What a warning for us to trust Christ moment by moment, to cling to Jesus Christ, our King, our crowned King, Jesus our victorious King, Jesus. Our Lord Jesus, who has already purchased the victory. The victory is ours in Him. And as we are united in Christ, as we are trusting in Christ alone for His grace, not just to preserve us in a negative sense from apostasy, but in His grace to help mature us to help us persevere until the end. How? By looking unto Jesus. This is the theme of Hebrews. From chapters 5 all the way through chapter 10. The Holy Spirit keeps bringing full front into our attention the person and work of our high priest, our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because ultimately, if these first century Jewish believers, as well as Believers in 2019, including you and I, will persevere. It is because of our high priest. It is because of the remedy and the solution and the treasure and the preserving grace that we have in him that we will make it to the end. Amen? Amen. Apostasy, then, is pretty much the same, though, as the sin leading to death that's mentioned in 1 John 5.16 where it says there is a sin that leads to death. So apostasy is more like that than it is like the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. What do I mean? Well, the Apostle John was writing in the book of 1 John, his epistle, his first epistle. He was writing about people who profess to be believers and were active in the local churches. Then they got to a place where they embraced the false teaching of Gnosticism and spitefully, decisively left the church. Their deliberate departure indicated that they had never been truly born again to begin with. As we read in 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they may be what? Manifest that none of them were of us. They were not of the believers. They were not born from above. They were not true Christians. And they're leaving Christ, denying Christ, repudiating Christ, and rejecting the teachings of Christ that he came in the flesh, that Jesus came in the flesh and was not some ghost or apparition, 
was evidence that they were not of the believers. They were not born again. By openly denying that Jesus is the Messiah who came in the flesh, born of a woman, they committed the sin leading to death, and it was useless to pray for their recovery. It says in 1 John 5, 16, I do not say that he should pray about that. If you look at the context in verse 22 of 1 John chapter 2, 1 John 2, 22, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. Now look at chapter 5 and verse 16. <clears throat> if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, that is, he will pray. And he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. So if you see your brother committing a sin, whatever kind it may be, all sin is serious, you're to pray for that brother or sister, Lord have mercy, Lord restore them, Lord forgive them, Lord melt them in repentance, give them grace to return to you and repent. But he adds, there is a sin leading to death. And he says, I do not say that you should pray about that. Well, who knows? what that sin leading to death or leading to apostasy would be. The context, of course, is describing Gnostics who denied that Jesus came in the flesh. And so doctrinal apostasy is a form of apostasy which drives people out of the church. We've had people leave Christ's Bible Church and go back to Roman Catholicism or go back to, or to go to some kind of occultist church denying the fundamental major doctrines of the Christian faith. Apostasy. God have mercy on them. You say, well, how can that be, Pastor Joe, when there's such weighty teaching at Christ Bible Church from this pulpit, covering an array of doctrine from Scripture, preaching the whole counsel of God, expounding the scriptures and expository preaching. How can people depart? Well, if they're not born again, there's no pastor or teacher can, that can captivate people's attention and hold them in the faith. Their hearts need to be regenerated, which will wake their minds up to the truth of God's word so that they fall in love with that truth, whereby they will not easily depart from it. Now, some sincere Christians are very troubled when they read Hebrews chapter 6. I don't know anyone who has not had at least some questions when reading Hebrews chapter 6. The devil uses these passages that are often very complicated, difficult to interpret, and even more difficult to apply to the conscience. The enemy takes advantage of vulnerable minds, even of true Christians, who project false interpretations on very complicated passages of scripture. And the devil uses these passages when he sees an opportunity to unsettle the minds of believers who, who are having real struggles, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, even physically, with such passages. They fear that they've fallen away from Christ and that there's no hope for them for restoration. And they worry about it. I've counseled many people who were concerned that they were apostates. They doubted their salvation for a long time. They lost their assurance of the faith. And they hadn't had the peace of God for a long time, the fruit of God's peace in their life. God's spirit bearing witness with their spirit that they are a child of God. And the enemy takes advantage of these doubts we may have from time to time. And that's why it's so important to live in the word of God. It's so important to memorize scripture. Memorize scripture. Make it part of your inner man. Don't go by your feelings. Don't go by the words of man. Memorize scripture. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Memorize all the major doctrines of the Bible, especially the doctrines of the atonement, the doctrines of Christ. Those doctrines will lead you back like a roadway, like a, 
like a roadmap, like a blueprint to Christ each and every time. When you memorize each doctrine of Christ, a sentence or two, defining each doctrine of Christ, they will get you thinking about Christ when you ponder them. And that thinking about Christ will turn into prayers to Christ, which will turn into faith exercised in the Lord Jesus Christ, which when you exercise faith in Christ, the grace of God is poured out upon our hearts so that all of these fears and struggles and doubts will evaporate in the light of clinging to Christ and trusting Him to help us persevere to the end of our lives. We have His Word. It's a treasure trove of truth that breaks the grip of doubt when we meditate on it day and night, when we walk by the way, when we're on our bed at night, falling asleep, meditating on the Word of God, thinking about the doctrines of Christ. But the fact that people are even concerned about be, being an, an apostate, the fact that some professing Christians are greatly concerned that they've crossed over the line is conclusive evidence that they are not apostates. An apostate would not have these concerns or fears because he or she would brazenly repudiate Christ. An apostate goes on the offensive in his heart against Christ. He crosses over a line in his heart. It's not a passive feeling. Oh, he loves me, he loves me not, I'm not sure, maybe he loves me, maybe I'm saved, I think I'm saved, I hope I'm saved. No, no. an apostate deliberately rejects Christ and walks way over into the category of the lost who is now an enemy of Christ. Some of the worst persecutors of the church were professing Christians at one time that became apostate and now are filled with rage and malice and resentment against our Lord Jesus and his church because they did not find something attractive in, about the church or about Jesus when they temporarily lived in the organization of the church. And so we're warned of a rise in apostasy at the end of the age. We are. And we're seeing apostasy take place, uh, perhaps on an unprecedented level. I know that the majority of the world has always been lost. We're not talking about the average percentage of unbelievers that exist in comparison with believers. We're talking about those who profess faith in Christ, who at one time called themselves Christians, who left, who apostatized from the faith. More and more of those kinds of folks are on the rise and are apostatizing from the faith. Now let's continue our exposition of the text. We left off at chapter 6 and verse 6b which says, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Let's back up to the beginning of verse 6 where it says, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Can you imagine that? An apostate is defined as someone who crucifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. That's a scary statement. Can you put yourself in that situation where you and I find ourselves somehow, some way, whatever this means, crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ, the one we love, the one who has forgiven us of our sins, the one who has saved us, the one who has used us, the one who, for whom we live? We would get to a place as professing Christians where we would crucify him, put him to an open chain, <clears throat> what we're talking about here, again, this person who has crucified Christ and put him 
to an open chain is a deliberate, malicious spurning of Christ. It's just not simply a careless disregard for Jesus. Shrugging your shoulders, ah, who cares about Jesus? No, this is a malicious denial, a deliberate rejection of Christ. It's a betrayal, a joining of forces against Christ and a ridiculing of his person and work. It's becoming that Pharisee at the foot of the cross who on the one hand was at one time among the disciples at a distance believing in Jesus but who leaves that group and walks up to the foot of the cross and joins the Pharisees who mock and scorn the Lord Jesus. You who are the Son of God, come down off that cross. I don't believe your word. I don't believe in you anymore. I'm disappointed in you, Jesus. I'm not fulfilled. I didn't get what I expected from you. So I'm going to become your enemy now. The restoration of such people to repentance, the Bible says, is impossible. Because they are crucifying again to themselves the Son of God and exposing Jesus to open shame or public disgrace. Well, in what sense does the apostate crucify Christ and put him to an open shame? The apostate crucifies Christ by agreeing with the attitude of the people who crucified him. The apostate is agreeing with Christ's crucifiers like the Romans and Jews. That Jesus is not the Messiah, but a deceiver, and therefore worthy of death. The apostate is like the good thief on the cross who at one time defended Christ and admired Christ and respected Christ and then went down and walked to the other side and exchanged places with the thief who railed at Christ. If you're the Son of God, Save yourself and us. The apostate now treats Jesus so disrespectfully, like one that I spoke with who was excommunicated from this church and became an apostate, who spoke so tenderly about Jesus at one time when I counseled him, when he first made a profession of faith, first came to the church. But after a couple of years, after he was excommunicated and left the church, the three conversations I had with him from that time, it was all about disrespecting Jesus Christ. And it hurt my heart to hear him say that, what he said about our Lord Jesus, so disrespectfully, when at one time he told me things that were just the opposite. They scorn the cross that they once held in high esteem. They show contempt and disdain for the cross in an open way, not guarded anymore, not nurturing any hidden doubts, but now as an apostate, they show contempt for the cross in an open way that brings shame and disgrace upon Christ and his majestic work on the cross from other people who are listening to such words, disrespectful words, blasphemy, blaspheming Christ. Only unsaved people can do this. Brethren, this is a very severe warning, and I don't want to be found at all with breath in me if I would ever say a disrespectful word about Jesus Christ. I only want praise and thanks and support from every ounce in my body, every gift God has given me, every skill, all my time, all my energy, all my strength, all my resources, I want to employ in the exaltation and the re increased reputation of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many apostates will be in the lake of fire sorrowing with vehement, painful contractions in their spirit 
for even one word of disrespect they showed towards Christ that someone could overhear and think the same thoughts about Jesus of disrespect and dishonor. Now, in verses 7 and 8, verses 7 and 8 of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul turns to the world of nature for an illustration that would serve as a counterpart to the true believer in verse 7 and to the apostate in verse 8. Let's look at verse 7. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. God picks a metaphor from agriculture where rain comes and the crops grow and this is likened to a true believer where the earth drinks in the rain and bears herbs useful, in other words, brings forth useful crops and vegetation. When the earth receives rain and bears useful plants, it fulfills its purpose and justifies the blessing of rain that God sent to it. But if the crops that the farmer planted remain stilted, have no growth, from the seeds that were planted, that land, that farmland, is not fulfilling the purpose for which the farmer labored so diligently for. That land is stunted, the growth is stunted. It's like God is saying, you've been blessed, but where is the fruit? The farmer labored hard, watered, planted seed, cultivated, but where's the fruit? God looks for what grows in us. We sit in church and there are farmers laboring on the soil of your heart. The word of God is being planted, is it not? As it is preached, as it is taught, whether it be in the pulpit, whether it be a Bible study, whether it be in your own personal devotions, reading and meditating on the word of God. The seed is being planted in you and God is looking looking for growth, maturity, maturity. That's what Hebrews is about. Chapter five, the rebuke goes to the professing people of God. Some of them had already apostatized and some of them were going in that direction. And the apostle Paul under inspiration of the spirit wants to stifle and retard the growth of that apostate seed that was growing in their hearts. God looks for growth in us after he blesses us, gives us gifts to bring forth fruit for his glory, especially looking for what grows in terms of maturity. Are you bringing forth fruit that comes from growing and maturing in Christ? The seeds that have been planted in your heart through your personal devotions, the use of the means of grace in public worship, Bible studies, fellowshipping with other believers, in your world of discipleship where you gather around other believers in hospitality or in just fellowship in different contexts. Is that fellowship and discipleship rubbing off on you so that it's helping you mature? Are the spiritual gifts of other Christians that you associate with having an impact in your life so that you are maturing and growing from those other believers exercising their gifts in your life. All of these contexts and all of these gifts which are exercised from our quiet time to the public worship of God and from the gifts of others are to combine to have us mature and grow in Christ that results in the bringing forth of fruit. And if the destination that all these combined resources of God are heading us towards, which is the bearing of fruit, does not take place, it's like this land that God describes here in the, through this metaphor of the farmer and the land that doesn't bear fruit. 
the purpose for which God designed worship and all of the context in which you study the Word of God is for you and I to bear fruit. Let's not get weighed down with the process. Let's look for the fruit. So much of us get weighed down with our rituals and we get in the routine of just going to church, coming home, going to Bible study, coming home, reading the Bible to salve our conscience, closing the Bible, going to work, and we get caught up in the religiosity of our religious rituals, but we're not focused on the end result like a good farmer, which is where's the fruit, right? Here's the point. God is emphasizing from chapter 5 through verse 11 through chapter 6 verse 13 the importance of bearing fruit in our heart knowledge of Christ. Brethren, I pray you would listen to me with your spirit. If anyone here, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the church. You need more than me to stand up here and read the word and teach the word and apply the word. You need to hear what God is saying. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Focus on the fruit. Where's the fruit of your heart relationship with Christ? The Lord's coming soon. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Go to him as his people and say, Lord, all these farmers have been sowing and watering. The pastor's been preaching. I've been reading and meditating. I've been keeping up with my walk with you. But Lord, only you can make the seed grow in my heart. Only you can make me love Christ more. Only you can bring forth the fruit of all my efforts in faithfully using the means of grace. You said is this the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Oh Lord, breathe life into my study and meditation of the Word of God. In my submission to the Word of God in public worship, breathe life into that Word to change me so I can bring forth fruit in my life. Amen? Amen. But verse 8 continues. It says, but if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be burned. Here, the Lord says the apostate is like land that is water, watered, but it bears nothing but thorns and briars, which is the fruit of sin. The land receives rain, but never produces useful plants. What good is it that the farmer's been sowing and watering all this time if he never reaps a harvest? What good is it if we as undiscerning Christians are always focusing on the means and the processes rather than the end of all of our works and labors and Bible study, giving to the Lord, all these things that God legitimately commands us to do, which is moving us in, always in one direction towards one object. Which is what, Joe? The end of the law is Christ. Jesus said to the Pharisees, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. Let's not commit the sin of the Pharisees who were experts at focusing on the process, of analyzing the process, of explaining the process, but they miss the goal, which is Jesus Christ. They were experts in the exposition of Scripture, but they totally missed Christ. A year and a half ago, I was sitting face to face with a rabbi in his synagogue in Palo Alto. For three hours, I went from Messianic text 
to Messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. For three hours, Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Isaiah 9, 6. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way. Uh, Proverbs 2, uh, or uh, Psalm 2. Kiss the, uh, no, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, his name shall be called Counselor. That's Isaiah 9, 6. Psalm 2, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And on and on and on and on. And he, there was this blank stare. Here he has three secretaries outside of his office and he's busying himself with the business and the organization and the routine of Judaism. But they missed the Messiah. I asked a, another rabbi at the VA hospital and the same city, Palo Alto, when I was having surgery. And they sent the Jewish rabbi chaplain to see me as I was being discharged when they saw my name, Joe Jackowitz. They, oh, this guy's a Jew, let's send the rabbi to him. They sent a rabbi to me, and as I'm waiting to be discharged there, oh, hi, uh, Mr. Jackowitz, hi, how are you? Uh, I'm rabbi so-and-so, and he had his uh, yarmulke on, and he had his little Jewish prayer book, his Haftorah, and he... You know, I said, well, let me, I'm not Jewish. What? What? I said, no, I'm not Jewish. I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. You are. And so while the, we were waiting for the nurse, I shared my testimony with him, shared the gospel with him. And oh, how his face changed. He was so disappointed. Maybe he figured I was going to stand up and schmooze with him for 10 minutes to make his time go by faster or something. I don't know. But... As I quoted messianic prophecy after messianic prophecy in my testimony to him, all I got was a blank stare. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's fine. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's wonderful. But nothing. No faith. He's focused on the process, just going through the motions. What are we doing as Christians? Focus on Christ. And if you have not received your portion of Christ each day, go back to your heavenly Father with an empty plate, with your hands and your hearts open. Even if it forces greater faith from you, don't take no for an answer. Cry to the Father and say, I must have Christ. I must have Jesus. We would know Him. We would have Him. We would see Him. Give me my portion that is mine of Jesus. If the ground gets rain but doesn't bear fruit, no one blames the farmer. If he burns that brown grass where there's no crops, the pastor can only preach so much. And in all the other forms you receive the word. Those teachers, whether, including your own meditation on it, can only do so much. You need to close in with Christ. You need to exercise faith in him. You need to keep praying and keep pleading and keep knocking and keep asking until he pours out the Holy Spirit on you with a fresh portion of the bread of life and a wonderful drink of the water of life and the presence and person of Christ being dispensed anew into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The bottom line is that the road to apostasy is paved by bricks of apathy towards Christ. And if the church gets to a place where they ask us, what think ye of Christ? And we shrug our, shrug our shoulders with indifference and, and we project this attitude of we can take them or leave them. What can we say about that? If you want to persevere as a Christian, if you want to mature, then you must give attention to Christ in your affections. Did you ever hear of the first commandment in the Bible? We shall love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It requires nurturing, time, effort, agonizing in prayer to pray down from heaven above a fresh dose of God's love for Christ in our hearts. 
Here's the process when, it, when a person becomes an apostate. The apostasy process starts, first of all, in neglect. Number one, neglect. When someone is routinely, listen, when someone is routinely neglecting the common means of grace, you can be sure that there will be spiritual consequences. There always is. The sin of neglect can have devastating consequences to our spiritual life. We read about neglect in the Bible in general concerning spiritual responsibilities. For example, 1 Timothy 4, it says, Do not neglect the gift that is in you. Hebrews 2.1, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Don't neglect it. There are certain things that we can neglect in our daily life and certain things we cannot neglect physically. You have to eat or you will die. You cannot neglect that. You have to go to work. You can't avoid that because you need the money to be able to buy the food. There are certain things you must do and you cannot neglect. And the same principle carries over spiritually. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. Those of you who are not saved yet, you cannot take or leave this issue of the gospel. Each and every time, whether there are times when you hear the gospel and your conscience is convicted and you're standing or sitting on the edge of your seat and it is as, it is as if God is being direct, speaking directly to your mind and heart and you're hearing him loud and clear or there are other times where you, you know, you kind of fade in and out. Your mind is not on the gospel and all right, I'll think about it. Maybe, maybe you say to yourself, but each and every time you hear the gospel, behind the gospel is a God who has taken intentional, deliberate steps to come as close as he possibly can to change your life. It was a deliberate act of God to send a messenger, whatever the form that would be, of the gospel to bring Christ to the door of your mind and heart and knock. Whether you're hearing the door or not, whether you care about God's coming to the door of your heart or not, is besides the point. God is there knocking. He's awake. He's alert. He's concerned. He's focusing on you. He's concerned about you. He cares for you enough to give you the secret message of eternal life that you must hear and that you must believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that you must believe he's alive even though you can't see him or hear him right when you hear the gospel on his throne waiting for your cries and call to him, God be merciful to me a sinner. He is deliberately sending you that message and he is expecting an, a response. He's not off playing golf somewhere like the deists believe. That God is disinterested in the world. He's a personal God. He's a God who sends the gospel trillions of times in one form or another through a very short period of time to a lot of people on, on the earth for a very important reason. And each and every instance where the gospel is preached, it is recorded. Every word of that gospel spoken by, by the messenger or delivered by the messenger is recorded exactly. The event, the situation, what the response was and the thoughts of the hearer of the gospel, in the, in the, the feelings of conviction, there was a description of the measure of response in the person's affections, motives, thoughts, attitude, heart. The most complete, exhaustive description of the giving of the gospel and the hearing of the gospel is recorded. Because on Judgment Day, nobody will be able to say, God did not give that person an opportunity. And that person's own response of rejection in all of the various ways and categories of rejection through the affections, the, all the intellectual capacities that join forces to resist and reject the gospel will, within that person who heard the gospel, will condemn them. Their own thoughts. Neglect. 
Just as an unhealthy diet will affect the body, so too negligence of spiritual food will adversely affect the spiritual life. Brethren, you and I, to be, we need to be living daily, drinking in the word of God until God takes away our stony hearts, until God makes the written word so living and powerful that we cannot resist falling down before the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. Until we realize and know in our heart that it is not a book that is speaking to us, that when we hear the preaching and teaching of God's word, when we read and meditate on it, it is Christ who is powerfully speaking to me. And I am trembling at the word of God, the word of Christ in response. Here I mean the neglecting of the word of God, personal Bible reading, prayer, meditation, gathering for worship, discipleship, Bible study and fellowship with other believers. This withdrawal may seem simple and harmless, but it has an impact upon our spiritual lives. Listen, if God has designed and decreed that he will only work and channel his grace, his power, his strength to us through the use, the faithful and diligent use of certain means, that's what he's going to do. If we neglect those means, then you are going to suffer. And you're going to have a greater battle on your hands with your conscience. The second part in the process of apostasy is, is indifference. Indifference. Specifically, this is indifference to the glory of Christ and his word. Listen, bear with me, indulge me here. If the luster and the majesty of Christ fades and he becomes routine and ordinary, where he's no longer compelling and extraordinary to you as he was at the beginning, but now common, it will drive a stake into the heart of our knowledge of Christ. <coughs> negligence, negligence of the means of grace will deepen an indifferent heart. Indifference is one of the worst things that can occur in Christianity. Because at one point, the Holy Spirit, through the Word, has revealed to his people the reasons why Christ deserves our utmost and fullest praise, worship, resources, talents, abilities, because he's revealed the majesty, glory, and beauty of the gospel to us. He's gone very deep with inside of us, revealing to us through our intellect, our imaginations, and our affections, the glory of the cross and the sacrifice of Christ. He's gotten a hold of us at times where he's made us weep tears of praise to Christ for laying down his life on the cross for such unworthy sinners as us. He's gotten a hold of us at times and has made us give away or get rid of possessions to us at, at some point in time that were very, very valuable. And we treated them as a light thing in comparison to how much we admire Christ and his word and his teachings that we would obey him and give, give of our wherewithal to the poor. Therefore, when we, for example, read the Old Testament, it was required of the priests to offer up the sacrifices after they have been ritually and spiritually purified, both in appearance and in the flesh, they needed to be clean and pure, and in their hearts, they needed to be zealous and enthusiastic in their work of offering up the animal sacrifices on behalf of the people to a thrice eternally holy God. They need to be at their best. Why? Because God is worthy if we really know who he is and have tasted of the powers to come, 
God is worthy of our best, especially when it comes to worship and in this area of growing and maturing in Christ. And so that's why neglecting the means of grace will deepen indifference. And, and why? Because we, we see the glory of Christ through the word of God by means of the Holy Spirit. But if you, if you neglect the word, then your eyes will grow dim in seeing the glory of Christ, as we should. You see, an organization has no glory in it. Christ Bible Church has no glory in it. Even if it's a religious organization, like a church. The church did not attract me to Jesus Christ. I hated the church. I wanted nothing to do with the organization of the church. I didn't even know what it, it was. My attraction was drawn to Christ first. And then I was eventually brought into the church and could appreciate what the church was and love the things of the church because I, may, I was drawn to Christ and fell in love with Him. And if I fell in love with Christ, I would fall in love with the things that Christ loves, like the church. So we need to maintain our love for Christ. And then we will not be indifferent in, to worship, to coming in here with this hurried attitude. All right, Pastor Joe, let's get on with it. I'm putting my time in. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, in the face of Jesus Christ. All the glory that you and I ever experienced about Christianity came to us in and through Jesus Christ. If we admired something so otherworldly and divine about the Lord Jesus Christ that, that was glorious to us as Peter, James, and John had the uh, revelation of Christ's glory on the Mount of Trans Transfiguration, the glory we have seen of Christ through the study of his word, through preaching and teaching, through those tokens and glimpses that have come to us of Christ through the years. Those are the things that we revel in. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the Lord. And the third and last thing is frustration. Neglect fuels indifference. Your indifference to the sacred, holy things of Christ and the glory of Christ in your daily relationship with Him will cause indifference to grow. And it gains momentum like an avalanche. Soon it grows into frustration. Indifference grows into frustration. This is because it's very difficult to continually engage an indifferent mind with a cold heart. You have no mental recourse to refuse a heart that does not prize Christ. If your heart is cold, you can search your mind for all the cold theology you want. It will not warm up your heart to Christ without the power of the Holy Spirit. The heart is cold, and the arguments for Christ are not only absent, but the ones for self are preaching loudly in their place. Soon this frustration of having to perform Christianity and keep up the pretense of loving and loyally following Jesus will be overwhelming. Frustration grows quickly into an uncontrollable force, an uncontainable force. Like a shaken up bottle of soda, it needs relief. They can no longer live with the dichotomy between head and heart. Soon, you give way to your heart and relieve your mind of the frustration of the contradiction and simply walk away in indifference. This path has been walked many times. People who have watched it 
can see the danger of simple negligence. We must battle for delight in Christ. We must maintain our love for Christ even when our heart seems cold. Don't give up. We must continue to wear out a path to the cross to preach the reality of the gospel to our own hearts until the Holy Spirit gets a hold of it and begins to thaw out our cold hearts. We need to have the beauty of Christ arrest our affections so that he makes all competition to his affections seem puny in comparison. This intentionality starts with an open Bible and a heart inclined to God in prayer, even if you don't feel like it. Open your Bible and pray and read. And even with the smallest faith, the Holy Spirit will come little by little. He will thaw out our cold hearts and he will pour in all the reasons in the world why we should be loving Christ and why we do love him. If you don't think you need this, then you already show your vulnerability. Do not neglect so great a salvation. If you do, you will in fact drift away. And this is the repeated warning of scripture. The wise man heeds and the fool reclines to himself and just lets what he hears bounce off. Be not hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. If the Lord has spoken to your heart, I'm speaking about something that is your most prized possession, your relationship with Christ, your love for Christ. What is more important that causes you for periods of time to set aside that love relationship with Christ? to neglect disciplining yourself until you come back to that place where all of the fruits and evidences of a vital and a healthy relationship with Christ return in, to some degree or another. What of this temporal earth, this vain world is so important that the love of Christ will not be renewed in our hearts for weeks or months at a time. There have been churches and there have been Christians that have wept for hours and weeks over the thought that I just expressed to you. Christ loves us. And he will not give up on us. But the longer we just are hearers of the word and not doers, we border on tempting God. We become more and more presumptuous of his grace that everything will continue as they were. My health will continue. My job will continue. All of these things that I am trusting in, especially presuming on God's patience, will continue as they did before. Brethren, if we are going to have revival at Christ Bible Church, it's got to start with our heart relationship with Christ that gets jump-started back on the path to maturity and growth, leading to final and full perseverance in the faith. We don't have a full audience in this room here. There aren't people banging down our doors to hear a message like this that is very searching, Christ-centered, but it is unadorned with fluff. If Read Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the warnings of Christ to those seven churches, and they, they are much more stinging and searching than, than I could ever share with you here. I am just a messenger. Don't shoot me. I'm delivering the heart of Christ as expressed through the book of Hebrews to professing Christians whom Christ does not want to apostatize, but on the positive sense wants you and I to go to full maturity. Okay, we all strong, struggle, we stumble, but God knows you love him. 
God knows the seed of God that he planted within your hearts that remain in you. All right, you struggled here. You, you may have had a, a spotty recent couple of months and you're not where you need to be. The Bible says forget those things that are behind. Get your priorities straight. Move Jesus back up to the number one spot on the list. Renounce every other thing that was in competition to Christ. See the evil in those things that appeared on the surface very desirable and very important, but now in the light of a fresh reminder of the value and the treasure that we have in Christ compared to Christ, what are those things now that we have poured so much time into and so much value and so much affection from our hearts? They're nothing. They evaporate and pale in comparison to the treasure we have in Christ. As long as I'm the pastor of this church, by God's grace, I'm gonna keep bringing it back to Christ. Christ, we must have Christ, and we must have the Holy Spirit declare Christ to us and deepen such an appetite for Christ in us that he will bring about revival here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great patience and forbearance with each and every one of us. We thank you for not dealing with us according to our sins nor rewarding us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is your love towards them that fear you. For you know our frame. You remember that we are dust. Lord, among your people, listening right now, praying right now, whom you have spoken to during this hour, and needed to hear this word. I don't know who you're speaking to, Lord. I don't know. I have no one in mind. You know my heart. But those whom you have spoken to, I pray you would help them to repent. Grant them a full and complete repentance of the sin of indifference, negligence, and lukewarmness and forgetfulness and hypocrisy. We all struggle with it every day, Lord, and we admit, we admit, we have failed you in one way or another. But we thank you that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. You said that, Lord. You said if anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You said if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You said, he that covers his sins shall not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Have mercy, Lord. Have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Lord Jesus, thaw out the coldness of our hearts. Quicken our minds to be razor sharp with insight into the value and importance and life and death nature of this truth regarding apostasy, regarding growing in maturity, regarding persevering to the end, regarding <clears throat> clinging to our first love. <clears throat> Sift us and wash us from the world, from the flesh. Purify our hearts if we are double-minded and pour out afresh into us love for Christ. Help us to maintain the simplicity of our faith and of our love in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.